Greetings, Father Mark signing on, continuing the series on U.S. Catholicism in the 20th century, moving into the 1930s, which brings us to the first New Deal. May 29th, 1932. World War I veterans, American veterans, began arriving in Washington, D.C. to demand cash bonuses that they had been legislated, but the legislation stipulated that they were not scheduled to receive them for another 13 years. Well, because of the Depression, they needed the money. You know, many of them were out of work because, of, you know, through no fault of their own. 17,000 veterans calling themselves the Bonus Expeditionary Force, the BEF, marched on Washington, D.C., demanding cash for their bonus certificates. They were led by a veteran uh, named Walter Waters from Portland, Oregon. In the years after the First World War, there was a a long legislative battle over providing a bonus payment to World War I veterans. Now, I should say, you know, a lot of things we take for granted now, like pensions for the military, that that didn't exist. There's no GI Bill at this, uh, you know, at at this point, and there's no no pensions. so that, that, that's what the, the bonus. And, it, you know, the, the debates raged between Congress and the White House. And then within Congress, there were, you know, differences of opinion based on all goes back to the beginning of the, you know, that, that, that what is what is the proper role of government? I mean, that 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 just keeps coming back again and again in our history. President Harding and President Coolidge both vetoed early attempts to provide a, a bonus to World War One veterans. As we said, in 1926, Congress finally got the votes to override Coolidge's veto, and they passed the World War Adjusted Compensation Act, better known in the popular, you know, in the newspapers of the period and the radio uh, of the period as the Bonus Act. The Bonus Act promised World War I veterans a bonus based on length of service between April 5th, 1917, which is when the U.S. got into the war, and July 1st, 1919, when we started demobilizing after the war. This would be uh, calculated as $1 per day for time in uniform stateside, plus $1.25, $1.25 per day spent overseas, with a payout capped at $500 for veterans who only spent their time stateside and $625 cap for those overseas. The catch was that this bonus would not be paid until each veteran's personal birthday in 1945, paying out to his estate if he should die before them. Although veterans were allowed to borrow against the bonus certificate beginning in 1927, but by 1932, that that was... That possibility was gone because of the stock market crash in 1929 and the effect it had on the banking system. 9,000 banks failed by 1932. So in May of 1932, out-of-work veterans of the First World War who were no longer in the military organized this group, the Bonus Expeditionary Force, to march. They were suffering. They were desperate. Their goal by marching was to apply pressure, public pressure, So Congress would give them the bonus payments, whatever they would do right then in 1932, when they really needed the money rather than waiting until 1945. So they they set up camps around, you know, the tent city in in, in D.C. And they also occupied some buildings in uh, around Washington because so many businesses were closed that, you know, that they had vacant buildings. The largest camp was a you know, shanty town or whatever you you know would call it, uh, improvised or improvised town, on the Anacostia Flats across the river from the Washington Navy Yard. By summer of 1932, meaning within a month, 20,000 had joined the camps, with some estimates totaling 40,000 on individual you know days. And because many were joined by their families because they you know, out of work, lost their homes. So, okay, what, what do we do? The camps also attracted others who were not veterans, but, you know, were just 
nowhere else, the homeless, essentially, or unhoused, whatever. Yeah. President Hoover, was president at the time, the guy who beat Al Smith, claimed, quote, that the march was largely organized and promoted by the communist and included a large number of hoodlums and ex-convicts bent on raising a public disturbance, unquote. Using scrap wood and other salvage materials, the protesters constructed a field of shacks in view of the Capitol, where Congress met, preparing you know, for sort of a siege of, of Congress. And they had, some, they had some allies in Congress. I mean, there were you know, those who, who felt genuine sympathy. I mean, so there were some veterans in Congress. So taking up the veterans' cause was Congressman Wright Patman, that's W-R-I-G-H-T, and then his last name, Patman, P-A-T-M-A-N. He was a Democrat from the state of Texas, himself a World War I veteran. He sponsored a bill that would immediately provide a $2.4 million bonus payment to be divided among veterans of the First World War. During the debate over the bill on June 15, 1932, another congressman, Edward Eslick, E-S-L-I-C-K, Democrat from Tennessee, was making an address on the floor of the House of Representatives when he suffered a heart attack. It turned out to be fatal. He died. The House carried on with his business, though with hundreds of veterans uh, in, in the gallery, you know, screaming. And the House passed the bill the same day. Republicans op- who, who opposed the bill, not every single one, but the, of, of those who did oppose the bill, the Patman bill, Uh, They did so mainly because it required the government to spend money that it did not have in the Treasury. The government, in 1932, was no exception to the hard times that had befallen the nation. Although the bill had passed the House, it did not have the votes to pass the Senate. The Senate voted the bill down on June 17th, meaning no immediate financial relief would go to the veterans. And even if the bill had passed the Senate, Hoover would have vetoed it, and and they did not have enough votes to override the veto. Just as the bonus itself had been vetoed by Coolidge and Harding in the previous years. So the bill had come to a vote and failed. And then you have at least 20,000 of these guys just hanging out. So, okay, now what do we do? The bonus expeditionary force refused to pack up and go home. As many of them didn't have homes. Instead, they continued their occupation of Anacostia Flats and vacant buildings in the D.C. area into July. At the end of July, July 28, 1932, the Attorney General, William Mitchell, ordered the D.C. police to remove the protesters from government property. I mean, public property. At the time, about 50 protesters occupied buildings along Pennsylvania Avenue. To leading to where the White House is. When, when D.C. police arrived to move them out, these veterans who were desperate, many of them with their families, and they were homeless, they didn't have any place to go, a riot erupted. It often happens, you know, one of the police got panicked, you know, and he drew his weapon, and he opened fire, and two protesters died. And then the riot really, you know, became a riot, a street battle. <clears throat> then the army, then, then you know, uh, Hoover called in the army, which introduces us to General Douglas MacArthur and one of his aides, Major Dwight David Eisenhower, and a, another mid-level officer, Major at the time, George S. Patton. Names will loom large in the Second World War, but this is where they first enter the historical stage. Under President Hoover's orders to drive the protesters across, you know, back across the Anacostia River, the army was in position by the late afternoon of July 28th. Once the order was given, the troops advanced, fixed bayonets, including tanks and tear gas, to drive away the crowd of veterans. Hoover twice sent messages to MacArthur not to cross the bridge. They just wanted to push the, you know, the, push them across to get back on the other side of the Anacostia. But MacArthur, this is it turned out to be characteristic of him, ignored it, 
And he continued pressing the BEF camp on the Anacostia Flats, even on the other side of the river. The camp was still inhabited by about 10,000 people. Eventually, they were driven off. Then the infantry followed and set fire to the shanties, to the improvised dwellings that they had made for themselves so they couldn't come back. D.C. hospitals were overwhelmed with the wounded and the panicked. Operationally, the exercise was seen as a success by the Army because, you know, the president ordered them to clear the Anacostia Flats, and they did clear the Anacostia Flats. Um, And the, the BEF, the Bonus Expeditionary Force, turns out, was permanently dispersed. The press, on the other hand, saw it differently. Even the Washington Daily News, the newspaper of the day, which was typically sympathetic to Hoover and the Republicans, called it, quote, a pitiful spectacle to see the mightiest government in the world chasing unarmed men, women, and children with army tanks. If the army must be called out to make war on unarmed citizens, this is no longer America, end quote. The political consequences were severe. The 19, 1932 was an election year, and the economy was the prevailing issue because they are, they are in the Depression. Um, so the, the spectacle of starving, ragged veterans being driven off by tanks weakened Hoover's bid for re-election. In November, his opponent, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democrat, was swept into office by an American populace eager for change. In retrospect, we know that FDR became America's longest-serving president, elected four terms. He he died during his fourth term, so he didn't didn't make the full 16 years, but elected four times. And he was a Democrat, and as it it turns out, another Republican would not hold the White House until Dwight Eisenhower was inaugurated in 1953. His immense popularity for his leadership in the victory in World War II overshadowed his role in the affair here on Anacostia Flats, and he was just a mid-level officer anyway. Okay. um, All right. Let's just stop. All right, in terms of church history, um, same year, uh, September 8th, 1932, Francis Spellman was uh, consecrated, was ordained and consecrated Auxiliary Bishop of Boston uh, in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome by Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, who would later become Pope Pius XII. And we will have occasion to meet this Spellman, who later became a cardinal. All right, Roosevelt, President 32. He was uh, born into a prominent New York family with Dutch lineage on January 30th, 1882. The Dutch lineage in the United States extended back to the 17th century colonial period. He was Episcopal by religion. He was Democrat by affiliate, political affiliation. He was raised with immense wealth, uh, attended Harvard, um, and passed the bar, became a lawyer in the state of New York. He married his sixth cousin, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, whom we previously alluded to. She was the niece of a previous president, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. She was the daughter of his brother, Elliot. In 1910, FDR accepted the Democratic nomination for the New York State Senate seat representing Dutchess County, a Republican stronghold at the time. FDR nonetheless won a landslide victory, even though he was a Democrat, causing many to regard him as a traitor to his class. As he's a rich guy, you know, pushing programs that can only be funded by the rich people paying more taxes. In 1912, he worked hard for the presidential election of Woodrow Wilson, even though FDR's older cousin, Theodore Roosevelt, was running against him as a third-party candidate. Wilson won, as we saw, and he rewarded FDR with the post of Assistant Secretary of the Navy. FDR was only 30 years old. His upward trajectory crashed, or not crashed, I mean it came back, but at least it, you know, it, it abruptly halted for a time in August of 1921. While on vacation on Campobello Island in New Brunswick, which is Canada, he, he got sick 
and it was uh, well, he had a few diagnoses, and eventually they decided uh, that it was polio. And there's some dispute about that, but whatever it was, it deprived him of the use of his legs for the rest of his life. After three years of work and, and rehab, he returned to public life, having mastered walking with crutches while his legs were locked straight with specially designed braces. So he was able to stand up to give speeches. And the rest of the time, of course, you know, it was a wheelchair. He allied himself with New York Governor Alfred E. Smith, even though Smith was Catholic. He supported Smith's unsuccessful campaign for the Democratic nomination in 1924 and his successful nomination in 1928. Even though Smith was defeated in the, in the actual election, Smith nevertheless supported Roosevelt in turn to follow him as governor of New York State. As governor, FDR pursued the progressive version of democratic ideology, meaning large-scale public work projects, judicial and prison reform, heavy regulation of public utilities, and because people were desperate after the stock market crash and the damage to the economy, he, um, uh, he won the presidential election in 1932. Following year, 1933, the first New Deal, so the first 100 days. So the term New Deal was coined by FDR when he accepted the nomination of the Democratic Party in Chicago at their convention on July 2, 1932. The exact sentence reads, I pledge you, I pledge myself, to a New Deal for the American people. When FDR took the oath of office, which at that point was still on March 4th, of, you know, of the next 1933, he immediately addressed the effects of the Depression. He closed the entire American banking system on March 6th, 1933, for four days to stop the panic. On March 9th, Congress passed the Emergency Banking Act. It passed in the House unanimously. It passed in the Senate 73 to 7. Roosevelt used this Emergency Banking Act to effectively create federal deposit insurance, a federal insurance for funds deposited in private banks, when the banks reopened. At 10 p.m. Eastern Time, that Sunday night, on the eve of the end of the bank holiday, as it was called, even though it was four days, it was just called a holiday, Roosevelt spoke to uh, on the radio. This is one of, you know, the first of his famous fireside chats, his radio addresses. And uh, the radio audience was estimated to be 60 million people. Um, to tell them in clear language, quote, what has been done in the last few days, why it was done, and what the next steps are going to be. It was the first of what turned out to be 30 evening radio addresses that came to be called the Fireside Chats, in which it included, he, he notified our ancestors, you know, the, the American people. First, gold hoarding and gold exporting were outlawed, punishable by 10 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. Second, banks could only reopen after obtaining a license from the Treasury Department. That license would only be issued by the Treasury Department after the assets of the bank were valued, calculated and valued, and documented. Third, a comptroller of currency was appointed to oversee the assets and losses of insolvent banks. Fourth, the Emergency Banking Act authorized the Secretary of Treasury to call in all gold, actual physical gold coins, gold bars, as well as all gold certificates held by private citizens in the country. So let that sink in. I mean, he's you know, this this ordering private citizens to just to to give their to give any gold they had to the government. And fifth, enlarged the market operation of the Federal Reserve banks. The result. Within the four-day banking holiday, 4,507 national 
well, banks that were part of national chains, national chains, meaning multi, multi-state, out, out, you know, multi-state, not outpost, franchises, whatever, yeah. along with 567 state chartered banks reopened with insurance on the deposits guaranteed by the Federal Reserve banks. Within two weeks of the four-day bank holiday, stock prices rose 15%, and the currency panic finally stabilized. Second, March 22, 1933, the Beer Wine Revenue Act amended the Volstead Act, which had been the enabling legislation of the Prohibition Amendment, to legalize wine, beer, and lager, and level, levied a tax on it, an excise tax on it, uh, of five dollars per barrel, a, a barrel of being, you know, in, in the definitions of the day, being thirty-one gallons. Next, March thirty-first, nineteen thirty-three, the Civilian Conservation Corps Reforestation Relief Act, which provided. Unemployment relief for young males aged 18 to 25 who would be channeled into the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, to work on reforestation, road construction, to prevent soil erosion, to uh, organize and beautify national parks, and flood control projects. These uh, youth would be under the control of Army officers, they would be housed in work camps. They would officially be paid thirty dollars per month, but twenty-five of that they wouldn't. It would go directly to their families. Projects were itemized on a list assembled by the Departments of War, Interior, Agriculture, and Labor. The War Department is now the, the Defense Department. The CCC had as many as five hundred thousand enrolled at one time. Now, that's males only aged 18 to 25. And it, it continued until the, first, until the Second World War. And uh, by the time, you know, that when they had the, the draft, you know, drafting 14 million, you know, to go fight in World War II, by that point, between 1933 and 1941, uh, the CCC had employed 2.5 million young males who had cycled through between the ages of 18 and 25. Next, April 19th. 1933. After having confiscated all the gold held by private citizens in the country, on this date, April 19, 1933, the United States officially abandoned the gold standard. This caused a decline in the exchange value of the U.S. dollar on the world market and therefore made commerce with the United States more cost-effective for foreign governments and business made it cheaper for them to do business here. Okay, in the midst of this, May 1st, 1933, dealing with specifically American Catholic history, the Catholic Worker Movement began. Let's see. I'm going to see something before I... All right. Um... Before I do that, I'm going to do that in a separate video. So uh, but I'll finish the New Deal first. Uh, June 16th, 1933, uh, was the end of the special session of the 73rd Congress. That's the New Deal Congress. So it adjourned on June 16th, 1933. At the end of the same year, December 5th, 1933, the uh, Constitution was amended for the 21st time. So the 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment from 1919. And that 18th Amendment was the Prohibition Amendment. So the 21st repealed that, legalizing alcohol. Uh, by the time the Prohibition Amendment was repealed, it, uh, it, it, was too, it had already succeeded in fostering the first organized crime explosion in American history. So all the lessons that were learned, you know, but to, to organize crime, suborning, you know, local governments, local law enforcement, uh, smuggling, 
you know, the, the street level, the organizing, you know, of, of, of turf, all, all that was learned. And, it, and it's just, it's never gone away. Now, the New Deal, it did have opponents, despite the desperation. So one of the opponents was from right here, the governor of Louisiana, Huey Long. He thought the New Deal, ironically, did not go far enough. And he led the Share Our Wealth movement, which demanded a guaranteed income for every citizen from the federal government. Now, he mentioned in this, you know, 1930s, $5,000 per year to make every man a king. That's a quote from him. That's one of his famous slogans. Um, On the other side, the other extreme, uh, there were two Catholic priests who opposed the New Deal. One was uh, uh, Reverend uh, Gerald Smith and the other Reverend Charles Coughlin. They created the National Union for Social Justice which denounced international banking, blamed the New Deal for allowing such corrupt enterprises to continue to exist. Yet it also called for a national pension for every person beginning at the age of 60. Midterm elections, 1934, November 9th. Democrats gained nine seats in the Senate and nine seats in the House. So that's a was taken as a public approval of the New Deal, enabling FDR to continue the New Deal into the 74th Congress. But since it's a new Congress, that's the second New Deal. So we will cover that uh, in a separate separate one. But um, I want to, so I'll end here. In the next video, because in 1933 the Catholic Worker was established, I'll do a, a short video on that and on Dorothy Day and then pick up yet another video with the uh, second New Deal. So for now, uh, we will pause. We will uh, pause here. Thank you for your attention. The session is adjourned.